So first, it's uh, I want to say happy Earth Day, even though it's Thursday. I think every day should be Earth Day. Uh, and if you notice a lot of things that are in the news uh, about climate change, because uh, April is considered uh, the, the day for Earth Day and uh, celebrating, but it should be every day. Um, also, uh, this is 50 years uh, that we've had the Clean Air Act. And thanks to the Clean Air Act, which was approved by a unanimous, sen a unanimous Senate and only one no vote in the House, and then signed into law by none other President Nixon on the last day of 1970, air quality across the United States has gotten substantially cleaner, even as industry and the number of cars on the road have increased. One of the bill's requirements was for the car makers to reduce tailpipe pollution by 90%. And the success of this bill is a reminder of how capable we are of cleaning up pollution when our political leaders are prepared to act on scientific evidence. For the first time in four years, action on climate change is gaining momentum on the federal level with the Biden administration. And California fortunately held ground on our climate policies during the Trump administration's rollback of environmental regulations. Now California lawmakers are emboldened to dream up big ideas and they are proposing a number of bills this legislative session. The influence of environmental justice groups on this renewed climate policy vigor is a main focus of our discussion today. Judy Mitchell will be my co-moderator. Judy was a member of the South Coast Air Quality Management District, AQMD, from 20. 10 through 2020 and was appointed by Governor Brown as a member of the California Air Resources Board, CARB, from 2013 through 2020. While a member of the AQMD, Judy championed the warehouse rule, which states that transportation warehouses like Amazon would have to use zero emission vehicles in their warehouse and provide charging for electric trucks using the warehouse. The plan for today's meeting is to have each of our speakers talk and then have a discussion when we will ask the questions you submitted when you registered for the meeting or that you enter in chat during this meeting. So I want to first I want to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Michael Mendez. Our featured speaker, Dr. Michael Mendez, an assistant professor of urban planning and policy and public policy at the University of California, Irvine document some of the crucial years of the environmental justice movement in California from 2006 to the present in his book, Climate Change, Climate Change from the Streets, How Conflict and Collaboration Strengthened the Environmental Justice Movement. The book recently won the Harold and Margaret Sprout Award sponsored by the International Studies Association. In his book, Michael Mendez, defines street science as an embodied knowledge developed within local communities, which is often dismissed as being anecdotal. He explores the perspectives and influence low-income people of color bring to their advocacy work on climate change. He believes California has played a leading role in the environmental justice movement and reports how this EJ, environmental justice movement, has influenced and improved the flaws of California's cap and trade carbon emissions reduction system. In 2021, California Governor Gavin Newsom appointed Dr. Mendez to the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board. The board regulates water quality in a region of 11 million people. Please welcome Dr. Michael Mendez. Thank you, Anne, for that very generous um, introduction and for uh, extending this invitation to speak to um, your democratic group. And I know the importance of local democratic groups. I used to be a board member of, of the Sacramento Stonewall Democrats. And we, uh, I know uh, from firsthand experience how influential these local democratic uh, clubs can be and um, helping select and influence our uh, next generation of local elected leaders. So thank you for the work that you all do here locally and regionally. So. Um, 
Uh, and I hope that you're continuing to push forward on these environmental justice and climate change justice issues. And as Anne mentioned that we're celebrating um, Earth Day this week and that every day should be Earth Day, but racial justice and environmental justice also should be uh, celebrated every day and should be inherent and everything we do, particularly around climate change, sustainability, environmental um, protection, and how we think of environmental protection paradigms in particular. So I'm going to be speaking very broadly uh, about my book and sort of the big, broad themes. And as I mentioned to Anne, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit more uh, in a conversation with everyone rather than me giving the lecture. And I know we have some great uh, speakers after me that are uh, activists or advocates from the social justice and environmental justice um, arena. So it'd be uh, very interesting to have more of a conversation if possible. But let me share my screen and just kind of start off with this idea of how we conceptualize environmental issues, climate change. Uh, when I started my project about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, when we thought about climate change, we also we often thought about it in these very abstract very global type of issues. And the polar bear really became this uh, symbol of what climate change meant. And for various reasons that I'll talk about, that symbol of climate change for the most part has been retired in the year 2021. Um, when I first started this project in uh, Northern California in Oakland, I was uh, working closely with environmental justice organizations and climate justice organizations there. And they were really pushing away from this global idea of climate change, that climate change was happening out there, out in, in some ecosystem on um, affecting uh, animals and plant life, uh, but not in our own backyards, not in the backyard or the port of o Oakland or the backyards here in Wilmington or San Pedro. Um, and they really want to focus on the human dimensions of climate change and climate justice. And as you can see from this, one of their flyers in 2009, they're talking about it's not just about polar bears. Climate justice is a, about youth. But if you, you can see sort of the pun they're doing in youth, uh, and they're saying it's about you as well. So it, em emphasizing intergenerational climate action, but specifically on the human dimensions and the youth populations. Um, there was an interesting quote I got from Brian Breveridge, who, um, who was the co-director of the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, one of the most influential environmental justice groups in Oakland. He told me, up until the last decade, climate change tended to be a white affluent issue about saving the rainforest and polar bears. It hasn't had deep relevance for people trying every day to get by in urban centers. Most, about, most of the messages about climate change are about eliminating global greenhouse gas emissions and not about people. So my book really looks at this uh, intersection of uh, foregrounds people, place, and power in the context of climate change and inequality, and uh, uh, really expanding uh, our conceptualization of what climate change means, how we define it as a problem, what data we use, whose knowledge we uh, validate and say is uh, considered an expert, and how we use that expertise and data to create solutions, and who's left out or excluded in those solutions and problem identification. This is particularly important because as, you, as all Californians, um, we, are, uh, we need to create more representative messages and symbols of uh, climate change because we are experiencing a major climate change crisis and historic racial unrest. Uh, in the last year alone, millions of people have been impacted by multiple disasters, fires, blackouts, heat waves, drought, has, hazardous air quality, a deep economic recession, and of course, the ever-present COVID-19 pandemic. These are all major life events. These compounding of disasters have cascading, cascading health, social, and economic impacts. And due to existing structural inequality, these impacts are disproportionately affecting low-income people of color. To address the climate emergency, activists and policymakers uh, recently have proposed the Green New Deal at the federal level. A radical proposal that, uh, to decarbonize our economy and address poverty and inequality. However, for the last two decades, low-income uh, low communities of color have also pushed state and local governments to experiment with reducing global greenhouse gas emissions in approaches that also addresses inequality and public health at the neighborhood level. 
These efforts in climate experimentation have been contentious and are often met with significant resistance. While I'm supportive of the Green New Deal, I'm here to say that there's nothing new about the Green New Deal. Climate change experiments in places like California since 2006 have been all out street fights. Environmental justice groups are often pitted against traditional environmentalists who favor the least costly mitigation solutions, which do not necessarily maximize equity and public health outcomes in low-income communities of color. These conflicts over climate change are cultural at their core. They illustrate that although the science of climate change is clear, policy decisions about how to respond to its effects remain contentious. Even when such decisions claim to be guided by objective knowledge, they are made and implemented through political institutions and relationships and all the competing interests, power, and racial struggles that this implies. So if we look uh, towards the exa example of California, it reveals the contingent nature of climate policy, the assumptions and social, political, and cultural attitudes that often create conflict between community understandings of local environmental conditions and the prevailing global top-down conceptualization of climate change. In California, tensions between different approaches to addressing climate change are often centered on the politics of scale, economics, class, and race. These differences in worldview, if unacknowledged, can lead to the breakdown of trust even among groups that are nominally working towards the same goal, reducing the harm that climate change would do to human societies and our planet. For insight into national level conflicts between groups working on climate uh, solutions, one should look to the nearly two decade California experiment of incorporating environmental justice and health equity principles into climate change policy. For environmental justice activists in California, the main threat from climate change is the disproportionate harm it causes to their bodies and to the health of their communities. For them, climate change is not just about global greenhouse gas models. Rather, it is also about, about opposing worldviews to which policy and science is seen. Yet California is still often seen as this homogenous entity that uniformly values environmentalism and climate action. This image universalizes the idea of climate change and detaches it from its cultural settings. It also obscures how the localization of environmental policy and science within the state involves processes of pu public consultation and legitimacy. For example, in this recent um, book that was published by a major university press, describes itself as the definitive book on California's environmental history, including its climate change history. But this book and its 300 uh, pages only mentions people of color twice and essentially in, as a footnote. So the traditional envir environmental narrative of California equals an erasure of people of color in enacting comprehensive environmental policy and leadership. So therefore, therefore I published my book, Climate Change from the Streets, the Streets, with the explicit focus on people of color. Again, my book foregrounds people, place, and power in the context of climate change and inequality. Moreover, this research originated in my public policy work for the California State Legislature during a 15 year period. This provided me valuable insight into how the interactions of governments, businesses, and NGOs shape climate change policy. My research is further influenced by my experience growing up in Latino immigrant communities of Los Angeles that face multiple environmental threats. At the youth in, in Pocoima, Silmar, Lake View Terrace, I was surrounded by people resisting environmental racism. Whether, pro, whether protesting the siting of landfills or organizing to demand the cleanup of toxic properties, they sought to understand how these situations originated, to develop alternatives, and to imagine new environmental futures. This has focused my work on what the conceptualization of environmental justice and climate change has meant to activists, policymakers, experts, and scholars alike. So in closing, this embodied research examines new models of engagement with climate change and justice that make space for alternative paradigms of environmental protection, 
My engagement with key stakeholders since 2006 has allowed me to critically analyze how the success of climate uh, change policy in California and beyond now depends on incorporating marginalized voices and embodied perspectives from the local and global scales. I look forward to hearing from uh, community and democratic leaders on this panel um, of their firsthand perspectives on environmental and social justice issues. Uh, these are the real heroes working day to day to improve our communities. And I'd like to um, be able to answer any questions about the, the perspectives I talk about in my book and, and the key examples as well. So uh, thank you. And I look forward uh, to having a conversation. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so before we do, we have many questions for you, but before we will have two other speakers, I wanna introduce uh, Steve Goldsmith. Uh, the Torrance Refinery Action Alliance, TRAA, a grassroots organization of residents and business owners who live or work in neighborhoods surrounding the Torrance and Wilmington refineries, formed after the massive Torrance refinery explosion in February, 2015. Through their activism, TRAA and the U.S. Chemical Safety Board uncovered the true threat of modified hydrofluoric acid, what we call MHF, uh, what this acid poses. MHF is a dangerous industrial chemical used in massive quantities in only two California refineries, Torrance and Wilmington. TRAA spokesperson and PV Dems member Steve Goldsmith will provide us an update on TRAA's TRAA's latest news about the fight against MHF. Here's Steve. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all. And um, particularly want to thank uh, some leading members of uh, PV Dems, uh, Connie Sullivan, Reggie Ju, um, Al Shadborn, and Judy Mitchell. And in the past, uh, in other meetings, I've seen Janice Hahn, who have all been uh, spent years fighting to get rid of hydrofluoric acid. Uh, and uh, my story was I was out playing tennis uh, on that day of February 18th, 2015, saw some ash coming down, said, ooh, that's not good, went home, turned on television, and ABC said there was an explosion at the Torrance refinery, but there was no air, there's no air quality issues. So I um, called them up and I said, who told you that? And they said the Torrance Fire Department. And... Um, so I repeated that at a meeting the couple of days later and uh, it got in the newspaper and a guy called me up and said, hey, uh, you know, there's hydrofluoric acid at the refineries, you should do something about it. So I called the meeting and one thing led to another and that's how we got this, uh, what became a mass movement. Um, and uh, it's interesting on some, I was looking at one of our, the, we use a lot of maps and if Reggie could uh, put up a, an ad that we put in that's currently running in, uh, uh, random length news. We make a lot of use of these, um, at, and uh, as you can see, these uh, large circles of uh, that are considered the uh, danger zones that encompass uh, very important areas. Um, and interestingly enough, the original map that we would show the plume, and it happened on that day that the uh, the plume went out of ash, went out towards the sea and hit Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach, Torrent, West Torrance and all. Um, and that generated a movement of environmentally involved people that was largely white. And, um, and it's only through we ex understanding that there's also the, a large amount at the Wilmington refinery, Valero, um, that we came to understand to get involved and build partnerships with environmental justice groups. And in the Attorney General Becerra's letter to the AQMD, he pointed out that these, the communities around to the east of the Torrance Refinery and all around the, the Wilmington are or communities that have an environmental justice percentile that's in the high 90s. And that means that they have a lot of environmental burden they have a high percentage of people of color and a high percentage of low income people. Um, and uh, the other important issue that hasn't come out so much about uh, uh, HF is its impact on national security uh, because the circles uh, you'll see include uh, LA Air Force Base, which controls our satellites, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, et cetera, but also at the other end of things, um, uh, uh, 
the, whole, the ports of LA and San Pedro and a number of other facilities that uh, would have devastating effects on national security and the economy of the communities and our lives. And you can see, of course, big chunks of Palos Verdes uh, are a threat. The hill might protect us somewhat, but the lower areas are definitely in a threat zone. And of course, we all shop and live um, in those areas and it would impact not only people, but uh, pets and animals, etc. So the basic lies that the refinery projected and they, they were able to do this by building an alliance. I'm not sure exactly how, I don't think in an honest way uh, with the building trade councils and therefore put a lot of political pressure on the AQMD and on legislatures. Um, um, Assemblymember Bonta submitted a bill and Assemblyman member Al Maratucci um, and those were stopped. Um, and then the AQMD uh, uh, staff presented devastating reports on the impact and the uh, et cetera. And uh, they uh, were able to block it there as well, despite the fact that large numbers of people from the local communities came and spoke. Um, the, uh, uh, there was a very broad uh, number of speakers uh, were translated. And so there was a lot of environmental justice. Uh, we had a program in Wilmington that included the NAACP. Um, and um, this, uh, the allies that we were able to build, the neighborhood councils, the uh, city councils of the Bay, Bay, uh, South Bay uh, beach cities, uh, the board of supervisors, uh, included very strongly Janice Hahn, um, and um, all, the, all the supervisors were supportive, and the five local Congress members, uh, Bass, Lowenthal, um, Waters, Maxine Waters, Ted Lou, and um, Nanette Berrigan have all been very helpful and supportive and submitted letters, as well as five senators, um, and Reggie could put up that, uh, that uh, slide. Uh, because this is an area that uh, if you scan down, uh, you'll see these are an area I'm going to talk about volunteering. Um, this is an area that we need help with. Um, so, uh, and the, and I mentioned the environmental justice index. We also did a study of um, the 41 other communities and found that they, um, uh, around the country also are very high on the environmental justice index. There's a really good EJ screen, it's called, that the, was created under the Obama administration and is lied dormant and hopefully will be picked up again, where you can put it, the address of a refinery or any facility, give the circle of danger around it, and hydrofluoric acid is one of the few refineries, uh, uh, chemicals that actually require a it's not one of the few chemicals because the benzene and all that, but it's one of the most that has needs that requires a worst case scenario and a risk management plan. So if you put that information in, it'll tell you the population, it'll tell you the uh, EJ index, um, it'll tell you the uh, uh, people of color, low income, et cetera. It's a very useful tool and I encourage you to use it uh, uh, for parts of LA, et cetera. And so the basic lies that the refineries have with their labor council, um, building trade council supporters have put that it's very safe and we know that it's not that and that we've had, and that, that it's never gotten off con offsite consequences. And we know that uh, in fact, there have been near misses and there was a near miss in Philadelphia in which 5,000 um, uh, people, uh, 5,000 pounds of it was released, but then there was subsequent explosions and it dispersed it, or we would have had mass casualties in 2019 in Philadelphia. There were 800 people hospitalized in a release in Texas, so it's it's not safe. That there's phony mitigation that they proposed, putting some chemicals in it, putting some water cannons, putting a cage around one of the storage tanks. This is all a lot of um, uh, you know wishful thinking that there's no alternative so that the refineries would close. But in fact, more and more alternatives are coming online. Chevron just finished one um, in um, 
Uh, Salt Lake City just came online. There's been retrofits in China and there's one working in Oklahoma. And also there are many available alternatives. We now know Valero itself uh, built one that uh, had um, came in, in in Louisiana with an advanced sulfuric acid. And um, that one is uh, came in and was built in three, in three years and for $400 million. So it's a lot of money, but if you compare the risk uh, for these companies, as well as the community of a mass release in the South Bay to the economy and to the infrastructure of the US uh, would be enormous. So what you can do, um, uh, the, because of these areas been blocked are the two areas that we have thought of and we welcome uh, new ideas is court action, either by the government or by a private lawsuit that we would be involved with, um, uh, and a national campaign for EPA regulation or legislation or both under the new political climate that we have. So we'd like you to email uh, the nominee Bonta, uh, General uh, Attorney General Bonta nominee, um, and ask him to take action. And maybe you have other channels to him. Uh, we would encourage that. Um, uh, to get work to get this issue into the November election and then next year's mayor's election. Um, we'd love for volunteers, like uh, we'd love to follow up with those five senators and reactivate them under the new administration uh, because uh, they wrote a terrific letter there and uh, they called for things and now their letter is two year, year and a half old and they could come back and ask for more. And um, so if you'd like to work on something like that, or work on legal action if you're a retired lawyer or an active lawyer and want to give some time to explore a lawsuit. And finally, uh, uh, come to our email, uh, email us at info at traasouthbay.com and get on our mailing list and come to our monthly meetings. They're Wednesday evening. And of course, you finally, you can donate to uh, help support the legal action and other expenses like the lawn signs. And we, we put out 100,000 of these on uh, door hangers on uh, homes in the South Bay. We can do a lot more things like that. So thank you for your time. And I think that's it. And I can add things during the question and answer period. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay, we're gonna get to our next speaker. The Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, it's called Lane, wants to update our people, our port coalition, and the fight to change the port trucking industry and end misclassification. Today, Mike Muniz, senior policy analyst for Our People, Our Port campaign, will educate us on three state policy initiatives they feel clean up our ports and support the truck drivers. Here's Mike. Hello, everyone. Uh, and th thank you for the opportunity. Um, is it okay if I share some slides? What well, they 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 uh, uh, really sort of drafted this first uh, policy was uh, uh, the Clean Air Action Plan, which was implemented. It was passed in two thousand and seven and began to be implemented in two thousand and eight. And so uh, what it did is that there were several parts of this, and this is my uh, this is the actual boss of the uh, the household here. Um, she loves it when I when I do presentations. She she likes to share a screen time with me. So. Um, the uh, what it did so it it, it tackled uh, the transition to uh, cleaner trucks because the the trucks that were operating at the ports were decades old, and so this enforced some new restrictions to try and get uh, newer cleaner trucks at the ports. It also had uh, rules that dealt with uh, the the actual equipment that the terminals were using, and then also try to clean up the ships that were docked at the ports. And so there was also a key measure in this, which was uh, uh, trucking companies needed to use uh, employee drivers to ensure that uh, the companies that were better funded were, were going to be able to afford to purchase the trucks and maintain the trucks. Uh, unfortunately, the trucking industry fought that employee mandate all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, it was stripped from, from, um, uh, uh, from the Clean Air Action Plan and you had sort of uh, a, 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 a problem where you had a mandate to buy cleaner trucks with drivers who were uh, uh, basically working poor. And so what happened is that a lot of them were trapped in this uh, 
uh, uh, system of, of uh, what they call indentured servitude, basically. With the, the, the USA Today did a four-piece article, a uh, series of article and investigative piece on it. And that's really what they called it, indentured servitude. And you had these drivers who were locked in these really abusive leases. Um, and, and the system sort of remains today. Now, a lot of these drivers have actually, some of them have purchased, been able to purchase their trucks. Uh, but you, we're, ha we're having a, a, another transition that's going to be taking place uh, pretty soon, which is going to have to move us from diesel trucks to zero emission trucks eventually. Uh, uh, Governor Newsom issued an executive order uh, and with the goal of transitioning to 100% trucks at the ports by 2035. And so if we don't deal with misclassification, a lot of these problems are going to rear their head again. And so uh, it's it's going to remain to, to, to be a problem. And so uh, uh, what, what we have uh, is uh, an, an, an issue of, the underlying issue is misclassification, right? And so that has been a problem since deregulation in the 80s. And uh, the, the problem was only made worse by the pandemic. Uh, what, what you saw right after the pandemic began and things got locked down was the amount of work sort of dropped tremendously. Uh, there was in some, in some cases a 60 to 70% drop in the number of, in, the, in the hours that drivers were able to work uh, just because China shut down for a good period of time. And that is uh, where the majority of our goods that are coming moving through the San Pedro Bay ports are coming from uh, from China and other South Asian countries, and so uh, you had drivers that were misclassified that did not have any access to to uh, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, who were trying to apply for unemployment but were classified as independent contractors. They're not classified as employees, and so um, you know there was uh, uh, it really sort of highlighted all of the things that were going on and taking place at the ports. And so uh, you had drivers who were getting sick. Uh, uh, this is uh, one of the drivers, uh, Manuel Chavarria. Uh, because he's misclassified as an independent contractor, all this time that he spent in the hospital, and I believe it was over a month in the hospital, uh, there was no access to sick days. Uh, there was no uh, uh, safety net programs because the, again, the drivers are, are misclassified. And so, uh, basically, the, the Teamsters and the family got together and uh, sort of pitched in and uh, created a, a GoFundMe page in order to, to help this driver pay uh, uh, for his medical expenses and, and then also pay for his truck. Because even though he was sick, that meant he couldn't work, but that did not stop the lease from billing him every single week. And so he had to still make his payments on his truck. And that's one of the, that's this whole problem of indentured servitude. You're leasing your truck from your company and whether you make money or not, you still have to pay, right? Whether you work or not, you still have to pay. And so uh, what we saw was that uh, towards the end of, of uh, 2020, luckily Cal OSHA came up with some uh, uh, new regulations uh, around um, uh, COVID uh, protection protocols. And they basically spelled out what each company needs to do in order to keep their, 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 their workers safe. And so using these new protocols, this driver, Manuel Chavarria, and then other drivers at Container Connection where he worked at, filed a complaint with OSHA. And we're waiting to see what, how that process plays out. They, the, the, the one thing that we're hoping is that OSHA will make a, a determination. They'll review his status, his work, how he works, make, determine that he is, in fact, an employee and then um, uh, make sure that the company provides uh, uh, PPE, not just to him, but to all the drivers who work at this company. And so um, this really sort of, I mean, it, it highlights uh, what's going on at the ports um, and how really misclassification is at the root of the problem. And so uh, luckily this year, there are three bills that our people at ports are really working on. And the first one is uh, SB uh, 338. It's sponsored by uh, Senator Lina Gonzalez, um, who used to be on the Long Beach City Council, as folks may know, and she's uh, always been a, a very strong ally of the campaign. And so what 338 does is uh, there is a list that the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement keeps of trucking companies that have 
uh, unpaid uh, settlements with their workers, right? Where the where a state agency has determined that a company owes their truck driver uh, money, the company refuses to pay it, so they get put on this bad employer list, right? The the idea is that, and there's also joint liability, where if a retailer or a shipper uses a company that's on that bad employer list, uh, if there is another violation in the future, then that retailer could become liable for the compensation that's due to that worker. But what happens in a lot of these cases is that uh, they, the trucking company will be found to uh, uh, illegally be misclassifying their drivers. They'll just pay the settlement, right? They'll pay the worker off, but they'll keep misclassifying their driver. And so what this bill does is it closes that loophole and you have to you have to prove that you've dealt with the underlying issue of misclassification before you're taken off this list. And the list only really targets repeat offenders. And so it's not, you know, just uh, some mom and pop company who has their first violation is not going to wind up on this list. It is targeted towards companies that have several offenses and who have not dealt with the underlying issue of uh, misclassification. Uh, the second bill, 794, is uh, uh, going to be very critical because, like I said, we're in that that uh, uh, new trend, the beginning of a new transition to zero emission trucks, and so we know there's going to be billions of dollars of subsidies that are going to be made available to the trucking companies yet again, and so what we want to do with with uh, um, um, uh, Assembly Bill 794, sponsored by uh, uh, Wendy Carillo, is so we want to make sure there's two things that are very important in this, right? That all of the infrastructure and all of the uh, new, yeah, exactly, the new infrastructure that, that's going to be built to support zero emissions, that those are high road jobs, right? But that the, also that the communities that are affected by pollution and by emissions actually have sort of a pathway to those good jobs, right? And um, we also wants to make sure that the manufacturing uh, component is also involved in with uh, with good jobs and they're providing good jobs and creating good jobs. Uh, the the second component of it is uh, it authorizes CARB to work with uh, uh, the workforce development department to create standards uh, to make sure that companies uh, again going after repeat offenders going after low road companies right that have consistently violated their their uh, workers rights are not benefiting from uh, uh, public su subsidies and that the state is not in the business of subsidizing an illegal business model. And that's what uh, AB 794 does. And the last bill that we're working on is SB 700 that's sponsored by uh, Senator Marielena Durazo. And this bill, what it does, uh, it's uh, without sort of getting too far into the weeds, uh, several truck drivers have gone through this process with the with the EDD to try and get their unemployment. And so what this uh, bill does is it codifies uh, some of the 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 uh, the rulings from that internal EDD court system that have said these drivers are in fact employees. The trucking company is the employer. And we have to be able to sort of look beyond the, diff the, the shell games that a lot of these trucking companies play to try and mask who the actual employer is. And so uh, basically what SB 700 does is it codifies what the EDD has already found and just says you have to use this standard going forward. And so those are the, the three bills uh, that are um, um, uh, we're sort of really working on uh, a, a lot right now. And uh, just another update on the strike. Um, so what happened is that there's this company called Universal Logistics Holding that came in and bought two of the largest trucking, port trucking companies, who also happened to be two of probably the worst actors, or the worst players at the ports, had a lot of violations, a lot of complaints against them. Um, but that made Universal uh, one of the top five largest port uh, trucking companies in LA and Long Beach. And in December of, I believe, 2019, uh, one of the divisions, uh, it's called Universal Intermodal Services, voted overwhelmingly to join the Teamsters. It was a very small division, only 26 drivers. Of those 26, I believe 22 voted to join the Teamsters. What happened is that a week or two later, it, Universal decided to close that entire division right before Christmas. It's like, a, you know, Merry Christmas present. You're out of a job. We're closing this division, right? 
And so the, the, the drivers and the Teamsters have tried to work with uh, Universal over the past year. They've tried to negotiate, uh, but Universal has really sort of uh, not wanted to negotiate. It's been sort of, um, they've been at loggerheads basically. And so this past week, the drivers decided to go on strike. And so they struck against uh, uh, Universal and one of its primary divisions where a lot of that work that, that used to be done by these drivers that try to join the Teamsters got shifted over to a non-union uh, company that misclassified their drivers. And so um, you may have seen at one of the terminals, uh, the ILWU in solidarity shut down the terminal and walked the picket line with, uh, with, uh, with the drivers. And so that was, uh, uh, for anybody in a, in a, that's ever worked with labor, uh, that type of solidarity is, it's, it's really encouraging and it's, you know, it's uh, it's historic, basically, and so uh, we also want to thank ILWU uh, workers for walking off. And I think that's that's it for my my update. So, thank you, Mike. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing, right? Okay. So I want to just uh, some people might think that Mike was maybe, as he said, getting in the weeds on some of these bills, but I wanted to just say this is an example of where I was saying there was, as he said, the governor, but also the uh, California Air Resource Board put down this edict about zero emission trucks. And when you think about the implementation of that, what Michael was saying is if, if, it, if the onus isn't on the companies, but on the drivers, then it's, you know, the environmental justice implementation uh, is, is, is unfair. And so it's getting in the weeds, but it's an example of when you do these edicts from up on top and you don't, and you don't do the implementation correctly, then it's the people who least can afford it who have to, uh, who suffer from it. So I just wanted to uh, follow that up. Um, we have a lot of questions and um, I, I wanted to get some from what, what people have put in from uh, when they registered, and then there will be some that are coming from the audience that I've uh, been made aware of. But this one uh, has to go back to uh, Dr. Mendez, and this has to do with what Steve Goldsmith was saying, and this comes from Carol Muller. So he, here you heard that we had the refinery uh, calamity in Torrance, and despite the TRAA and, uh, and the citizen outrage and action, the combination of oil money and union resistance have thwarted efforts even to attempt to mitigate this very real and immediate environmental threat. So what suggestions do you have for us to gain some justice for so many who live within the boundaries of this continuing risk? Um, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I oh, this has didn't to do quite with follow. What Steve Goldsmith, the Torrance, the Torrance uh, Refinery Action Alliance. So he was explaining how they they became a group because of the refinery explosion back in 2015, and yet they're they're facing oil money and unions uh, against mitigating this uh, MHF risk that is still there, and um, and so he's. So the question from Carol, from Carol Muller is, what suggestions do you have basically for them to build a coalition to gain some justice for so many who live within those boundaries and are risking another explosion from that refinery? Um, I'm not as familiar with the Torrance one, but I, I've done work in Richmond, California, which is one of my field sites is looking at um, the oil refinery, the Chevron refinery, which happens to be the largest oil refinery west of the Mississippi and California's uh, Sorry, I live in downtown uh, Long Beach. Um, and the Chevron refinery also has to, happens to be the, the single largest uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in, in the state, as well as um, one of the larger pollution, uh, polluters of local pollution that affects people's health. And you, the Chevron refinery has been very involved in local politics there and, and, uh, and from, in the city hall and, and the council members and trying to really um, direct um, the, that the government in terms of uh, 
how the, the city government should be run and its approach to uh, regulation of the Chevron refinery. And uh, this community is uh, primarily African-American, API and Latino, and are constantly struggling uh, with that influence. And the biggest um, uh, the success that they have is, is building these coalitions and uh, keeping these issues um, and sort of uh, influence of, uh, you, of these global corporations in local politics and state politics. It's quite important and, and understanding that it doesn't stop just at City Hall um, where uh, these inequities are happening, but it's also other scales. Uh, many of the advocates working in Richmond, I would see them in Sacramento and working on how, how to rescale and refocus uh, some of the inequities in California's climate change uh, programs to focus back on equity, public health, and justice. So it takes uh, multiple prongs, not just focusing just on the local um, um, protesting and action there, which is quite important and, and it's fundamental, but also thinking bigger and how, how can your, that story or injustice link up with other um, policy priorities at the state, um, regional, or uh, federal uh, level as well. So Connie Sullivan had a question um, for Mike Munez. Did you wanna ask your question or did you want me to ask yeah, it? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask it. Hi, um, I don't see him, but um, I've been listening to these uh, talks by Lane for quite a while. I think it's outrageous, this misclassification of the, um, of the employees, it doesn't, it seems to me it's illegal too. I'm, I'm fairly certain the Labor Code of California describes an employer-employee relationship and it's, it's outrageous that these companies have been allowed to circumvent that, but it just goes to show what money can do. But I'm wondering if the passage of Prop 22 last year that um, where the Uber and Lyft drivers are now, uh, the people of California said the Uber and Lyft drivers are independent contractors when they are not. Mm -hmm. If that um, uh, impacts you in any way, and do you see that making your job harder? Sure. Uh, so the the interesting thing about Prop 22 is I think they sort of they try to focus it primarily on app based uh, companies, and I think that was that that language was specifically uh, put in there for to to try and separate the uh, the the app based companies from. Um, uh, from AB5. The thing is, is that there are, uh, there's at least one trucking company uh, that uses an app to just to, to send out their drivers. Uh, so in, in that sense, at least one of these companies might fall under that umbrella. Uh, but even before Prop 22 was passed um, uh, by the voters, AB5 was challenged in the courts by the California Trucking Association. And so right now there's currently an injunction on using AB5, the ABC test, to determine uh, employee status of, of truck drivers. And so we have to, and there's been sort of conflicting uh, court decisions uh, up to now. Some courts have ruled out that, that, that um, the state of California can use AB5. Uh, some have ruled that they can't. So we have to wait for the play out both at the, at, I believe it's, it's working its way to the uh, Ninth Circuit. And once the Ninth Circuit makes a, deci a decision whether or not uh, California's AB5 is uh, basically preempted by federal law, uh, then the state will be able to say, okay, we can use AB5 or we can't use AB5. The good news is that even though AB5, uh, the ABC test is a much easier uh, test uh, to prove employee status, uh, of the over 500 cases that have made their way to the, the, the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement, out of those 500, I believe it's 90, somewhere around 94% have been determined to be employees. And that's using an older, more complicated standard called the Borello test. And so even under that harder standard to meet, drivers have been found to be employees. And so that's encouraging. Uh, the problem with, with these individual determinations are, they, are, are just that, they're individual determinations. So even if it's five drivers at a company that, em, that employs uh, 100 drivers, only those five drivers are subject to the decision. The other 95 drivers are not part of that decision. So the company can still keep misclassifying these other drivers. And so that's why until the state uh, actually starts to audit these companies 
these companies that have been found to misclassify their drivers. Uh, and until these companies actually prove that they've actually stopped the underlying problem of misclassification, it's still going to be going on because these trucking companies can save 30% right off on personnel costs because they don't have to pay unemployment, workers comp, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, and so they get to save you know, a ton of money just on personnel costs. And then you, you factor in them forcing the drivers to pay for their own trucks, pay for their diesel, pay for their insurance and the maintenance, right? The cost to keep up these trucks is put on the drivers, right? These people who make anywhere between 29 uh, to 30,000 or $40,000 a year uh, don't have the resources to buy a $12,000 diesel particulate filter. So what do they do? They put off making those, those uh, upkeeps and they just keep polluting until they're forced to do so. So that's, you know, that, that's how misclassification and, uh, and the, um, the environmental impacts are sort of like woven in to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, I, we did have a go back uh, for Steve Goldsmith to, to talk about the other question I asked. But before I do that, Judy, since you've been involved with this zero mission, do you have a comment here as well? I think that, uh, thank you, Mike, for coming and, and highlighting some of these issues for us. Um, speaking from uh, sort of as a past regulator on AQMD, um, the trucking industry in the ports has been a big um, issue for us. And uh, as you know, uh, the South Coast AQMD uh, provides a lot of incentives for our truck drivers to um, either retrofit a truck or uh, buy a new truck. Um, but there, as you said, there's a lot of these misclassifications or independent owners who really can't afford that. And so this has been a big issue for us that we have now, I think, some six to 8,000 trucks in the ports that are um, uh, earlier than 2010 maybe even 2006, those are kind of the two dates that stick in my mind. And every truck has to be 2010 or newer by the year 2023 under CARB regulations. And so uh, this was a big passion of mine as I was leaving AQMD at the end of this last year, working with Mario uh, and some of our staff at AQMD to see what we could do about that. So it's still on my, uh, on my radar and um, um, be happy to work with you in any way I can, you know, to help make those transitions. I cannot lobby or do anything in front of AQMD as a past board member, but you and I could chat and maybe Absolutely. talk about those issues. Thank, Thank you. you. And I will say this, that AQMD is the only environmental regulatory agency that actually has language that asks, that even asks, have you violated a, a truck driver's rights in the past three years, right? On the, uh, the Carl Moyer program, that language was implemented. And so uh, that is uh, uh, the model that we try and use when we contact, when we try and work with the ports of LA. It's like, you need to include this type of language in your grants and your subsidies to make sure that you're checking to see whether or not, and it, it is, the companies are, you know, it's just an, an attestation. They, they could say like, yeah, we've never violated, but there's also a, a provision in there that if they do get audited, that they do, AQMD has the right to pull back that money. And I think that is a very important sort of hook that, that will, uh, you know, uh, help push these companies to do the right thing, basically. Right. I know it's a problem we've grappled with at the board level on, on numerous occasions. Thank you. Thank you for bringing the problem to it to us. Uh, so everybody here on the PV Dems can hear about it. Love your cat. OK, uh, uh, Steve, you had one comment. I, one more comment on the TA. And I, I do want to move on to some com some more questions. To Dr. Sure. Very quickly, the uh, issue for the um, uh, on the question of coalition with, uh, and we see the building trades, which actually the leaders of the building trades are violating the interests of their own members, because if these alternatives were built, it would actually produce jobs. So it's the other labor unions, the progressive labor unions, we have to figure out a way to build coalition between them on these environmental issues and get them to prioritize 
this uh, as a uh, community issue because, for example, the ILWU is only 5, 000, less than 5,000 feet from the alkylation unit at Valero. Uh, a release there would be on them in a few minutes. Uh, Michael's truck drivers are driving through those areas all day long, every day, um, without any way to be warned or known that there's been a release uh, from uh, from a refinery. Um, we we counted in one 12-hour period at the Torrance refinery, 1,400 large trucks go through the intersection at 190th and Crenshaw. And over at the other refinery, it's vastly more because it's near the port. The port is only uh, less than three miles. And that's where all these, if we wipe out that workforce, the whole economy of the United States could be shut down for months until it's replaced and trained. So the unions have a real, and they were kind of quiet. Um, uh, we know they supported the idea of protecting the, the community against this threat but they haven't made it enough of a priority to oppose another union who's taken a really bad stand. Okay, uh, Mike, you're still on, right, Dr. Mendez? Um, uh, yes, sorry, okay. I, I got kicked out for a, a minute there. Um, oh bad Wi-Fi to this morning, this Sunday. Okay, uh, anyway, this, this question uh, goes to your uh, the theme of your book. Um, after the cap and trade ruling under Governor Schwarzenegger in October 2011, where he focused on just the companies and not the communities, explain why it didn't work for the poor communities. In terms of uh, cap and trade, why, why is environmental uh, justice? Schwar well, under Schwarzenegger, it since got modified under Brown, but why, you know, why wasn't it working and what, you know, what do you think works well and what doesn't? Sure. In general, um, not all, but in general, uh, environmental justice uh, uh, organizations are uh, philosophically opposed to market-based mechanisms, which cap and trade is for putting a price on pollution. Um, and it's, uh, they prefer more what's called command and control or direct regulation, ensuring that uh, polluting facilities that are in their communities and their neighborhoods um, have to do direct emissions reductions on site in a timely um, an expedient uh, fashion. And their argument against cap and trade is that in, is essentially that um, older facilities or facilities uh, and communities of color are less likely to uh, reduce emissions uh, reductions on their own, um, upgrade facilities so that they're reducing below that cap, um, rather that they're gonna um, essentially continue to pay to pollute. So they're gonna be buying pollution credits either through the state auction or buying them from other, um, other um, less polluting um, uh, companies such like Tesla that has excess pollution, uh, pollution credits to sell. And um, that essentially no pollution um, uh, or a, a nominal pollution reduction is gonna occur within the most polluted environmental justice communities while the statewide uh, um, uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, as well as local pollution that affects people's health, um, will happen at the statewide level, but not in the most impacted communities. And under um, a cap and trade system, um, in, in their opinion, really bars them from direct oversight of regulation. Um, th these the, the auctions happen in sort of a, a sort of a non-transparent way, and, and there's. A, there's public hearings, of course, that happen, but it's very different from a com command and control where uh, it's a permit um, it, or it's a land use issue, and you can go and go to your local government um, or state or state board or commission and really try to oppose some type of noxious uh, uh, use that's going to be uh, permitted. Uh, so that direct sort of uh, engagement um, in. in in the uh, rulemaking, pro the regulatory process is, is different under a cap and trade auction sort of uh, market system. So that's what the, I think it's a lot of uh, differences in terms of approaches and philosophies around um, what cap and trade uh, will do for the other communities and what it, uh, what they perceive it won't. Um, let me see. Uh, could you explain the how the coalition that was formed by the California Environmental Justice Alliance 
with academic researchers, which was aided by Kevin de Leon's legislation and that was signed by Governor Brown in 2012. That was the legislation which created the Climate Change Community Benefits Fund. Uh, how that improved the cap and trade bill for poor communities. Uh, well, uh, uh, Stephen talked earlier about the, at the federal level that there's this EJ screen that you use a census track um, data to identify um, environmental justice communities or the most polluted uh, communities. Well, California is sort of the forebearer on that. It, it's the innovator. We experiment and we're uh, uh, state and national and global leaders on uh, environmental and climate experimentation. And uh, they helped develop this, um, this tool to essentially do what I just, what the EJ screening tool is considered the best science on environmental justice uh, screening tool. And it really direct, it lets us understand what does environmental justice looks like, where is it, um, and how does it sort of uh, manifest and change over time. And that tool's being used uh, and codified within uh, regulatory and policy decisions at the state. And, and to some extent, uh, some local governments are using it for their uh, policy making, decision making, particularly on uh, providing uh, budgets and grants on towards um, environmental um, mitigation um, in the most polluted communities. So th that had been a tool that was developed by EJ groups um, and uh, academics such as Manuel Pastor, Rachel Morella Frosch at uh, UC Berkeley and uh, James Sad, I believe. Um, and again, this was a 10 year process working together and the state um, did not want to uh, adopt this for many years. It took 10 years for it to finally to be adopted by the, uh, passed through, uh, adopted through a legislation where the state was essentially forced to implement this law. But there was a lot of pushback um, by regulators themselves, um, the rank and file, as well as industry groups, including uh, not just chemical industry and polluting industries, but also the real estate. Um, realtors were opposed to having this tool for fear that um, it was going to depress uh, real estate values. And uh, I document that in the book. And it really showed um, and sort of the might of um, how the environmental justice groups over the years have really developed these strong alliances uh, with environmental uh, justice groups throughout the state, uh, public health, housing, um, and other types of uh, groups to support uh, su such type, type of tools. And specifically working with uh, Latino legislators within the, leg uh, the California State Legislature um, and really creating these strong allies where they're really getting uh, mainstream environmental uh, groups and legislators from primarily white districts to put environmental justice at the forefront. And, and uh, in the book, I talk about how they consolidated power and um, uh, Latino legislators were uh, working with uh, the other uh, caucuses, the uh, African-American caucus and the API caucus as well, to essentially withhold votes on a major environmental uh, legislation until it started to um, address uh, some of these key environmental uh, justice issues. So I'm gonna to get to Mary Ross's question. Um, what do you see as the most critical issue that we as Californians need to immediately address then? Michael. Did, did you freeze? They're both Michael. Oh, uh, I meant for Michael Mendez. <laughs> yeah, he um, froze. I, yeah, I think he's I, having some um, internet I think he difficulties. Got, I think he has frozen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's gone. Sorry about that. Okay, but um, actually, on that, um, you know, Judy, you could, you could, you know, in terms of your uh, sitting on both this CARB and AQMD, you could talk to that as well, because you see what's coming down that we have to meet our our uh, quotas here in the LA area and in terms of air quality and you don't think we're gonna meet them. Yeah, I think for um, the South Coast region, we have uh, two deadlines coming up under the Federal Clean Air Act to meet uh, ozone requirements. 
Uh, one is in 2021 and or 2023, and one is in 2031, I believe. But for us, we had to reduce NOx emissions because NOx actually um, mixed with sunshine creates the ozone. So our big pollutant here is is NOx, and that is primarily a tailpipe emission. Um, and so uh, the big dilemma for say a local air district is that. Uh, we don't control mobile sources. Uh, CARB controls mo mobile sources. So we have to reduce mobile source emissions over which we have no control in order to reduce NOx emissions and meet the uh, deadlines that are coming forward in uh, 2023. And at my last CARB board meeting, uh, that was when we discussed the mobile source strategy at CARB there was an admission by our staff that uh, South Coast would not be able to meet those de that first deadline. We may be able to get close by 2031, but then that raises uh, the issue of what will happen when we don't meet that deadline because uh, the federal government can take over our, our uh, air quality management plan at that point and impose penalties on us. So that's... Uh, an issue that we're going to be facing uh, in 2023. So uh, big problems, big issues coming forward. Maybe there won't be severe penalties. If it's under a Biden administration, perhaps, you know, we'll get some more help there. But we were very concerned about that, what might happen under, uh, the, under a Trump administration, for example. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's uh, that's one reason why the truck transformation in the ports is so important too, you know, to get those diesel emissions uh, taken care of and that will help us reach those, reach those uh, ozone requirements. I think Mike is back with us. Yes, yeah, sorry, I have my internet for real, really yeah, bad. Yeah, that's okay. I, uh, they, they thought I was talking to the other Michael. <laughs> Anyway, the question had to do with what is what do you see as the most critical issue that we as Californians need to immediately address? Well, I, I don't think uh, it's multiple. Um, we're, we're California, uh, Texas, uh, Florida, at least in the United States, are at the forefront of the climate crisis. Unfortunately, we're, uh, these three states are experiencing multiple forms of uh, climate change impacts or cli uh, climate induced disasters. So I, I think key, of course, is our air quality. Our primarily uh, the the, pri the the primary goal of the uh, CARB, the Air Resources Board, has always been air quality and public health. And over the years, it has um, with climate change and AB thirty two has really shifted away uh, from that. And the environmental justice groups have really focused. If we're going to be putting so much time and energy on climate change. We have to be more um, strategic about co-benefits and multi-benefit type of policies. And then, you know, in the book, I talk about sort of this carbon reductionist or uh, carbon myopic view of where the, the key goal had always been just this global focus on um, carbon emission reductions and sort of this geographic neutrality of where we reduce carbon emissions and environmental justice group really arguing that it matters where global emissions are reduced alongside local emissions because uh, for the most part, uh, not always one-to-one, -one, but for the most part, uh, fossil fuel burning, of course, releases greenhouse gas emissions that fuels climate change, but it also releases a lot of the harmful local pollution, the precursors of smog that affects people's health. And that bifurcation of policy um, is a hindrance to achieving environmental justice, racial justice, and quite frankly, building coalitions and strong coalitions to support um, comprehensive climate action. And so I think that's first and foremost is having that racial equity lens and thinking more holistically of our air quality policies, both of the local and global in nature and not bifurcating or creating these, uh, these strict policy silos. Um, uh, a second is the climate adaptation. In the early years of California's climate change program, again, it was that sort of just carbon reduction, um, a reductionist view of we're only going to look at mitigation. And it wasn't until at least 2009, 2010, that, that California really uh, focused on climate adaptation, first at the statewide level, and then community groups, both from the traditional environmentalists 
and specifically from environmental justice groups really arguing about neighborhood level, neighborhood scale climate adaptation, that the, the impacts from wild, wildfires, heat waves, um, flooding, um, drought in particular, uh, were impacting uh, low-income communities of color most and foremost, and that these communities should be at the front of the line since they're frontline communities in climate uh, adaptation strategies, uh, not just at the statewide uh, scale, um, that really uh, doesn't look at neighborhoods, but looking at that uh, community level impacts as well. So mitigation, uh, comprehensive um, and holistic forms of uh, mitigation, co-benefits, multi-benefit policies, and then climate adaptation. I would say those like sort of the, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, the two key things uh, that are most important in California at the moment. And let me, let me say something about that. If I could. Uh, because, and Michael understands this, that the way uh, the government deals with climate change and pollution is built into a lot of silos. And that's what he's talking about when he says you've got, you know, these different silos built up dealing with one thing on this side and another thing on the other side. And we need to bring those together so that they all work together. For one thing, Climate change is delegated to, at the state level to CARB. Local air districts do not have any ability to uh, pass regulations that address climate change. We deal with pollution, with criteria pollutants. But one thing we try to do in all of our regulations is when we're dealing with a regulation on pollution, we, we're looking for co-benefits in carbon reduction as well. So that has been the policy, both at the CARB level and at the local air district level, to look for those co-benefits in every regulation that, that comes before us. So just want to explain that to, to, our, to, our, to our members. Yeah, yeah and thank you, um, uh, uh, Judy, for that. And California is a leader on that co-benefit uh, uh, framework. Um, it didn't always agree with that, and they were pushed, regulators and uh, state lawmakers were pushed by the environmental justice communities, and the EJ communities deserve credit, but because of that, and that's sort of, that's why the subtitle of my book is how conflict and collaboration strengthen the environmental justice movement, but because of that sort of conflict and now collaboration, um, California is succeeding on um, the best state of science around these co-benefits and holistic thinking. And, and I'm not saying everything's really, obviously it's not. So we still have a lot of environmental justice going on, but a, a lot of progress has happened uh, because of uh, tension and collaboration. I know right. David Hall, you have a question on your, on going carbon tax federally. Did you want to ask it? Are you unmuted? Yeah, I'm unmuted now. So uh, my feeling is that uh, the climate change issue is the overwhelming issue for humanity. Everybody, for, for rich and poor alike, uh, are, are going to be very significantly affected if we don't do something. So I'm interested in what is politically feasible to pass on a countrywide level. And there, it seems to me that the, the conservative, politically conservative uh, members of the legislature, the, the House and the Senate, are much more likely to uh, agree to a price on carbon approach, especially if that is not a tax, if if that money is returned to the population as a benefit. Um, and uh, economic uh, studies forecast that poor people will actually get more benefit than they see rise in their energy costs. So it does have an environmental justice uh, opportunity uh, as well. Uh, could you comment on that, Michael Mendez? Okay, okay. great. Th thank you. Um, that's an interesting question about uh, the carbon pricing. Um, 
Yeah. You know, during and uh, Judy obviously knows this of, uh, as well. During this whole debate in California about cap and trade, um, back 10, 15 years ago, environmental justice groups wanted carbon pricing. And even though carbon pricing is a, still a market-based uh, mechanism, uh, you're still putting a price on, uh, on pollution. Environmental justice groups felt that was more transparent, um, uh, uh, that tax was more transparent because the auctions and who buying and trading, to some extent it's considered uh, proprietary and trade secret. Um, so there was more transparency for them. But now fast forward in 2021 under the Biden administration, it seems, um, uh, um, and I still need to research this a little bit more, that environmental justice groups have even moved away from even um, supporting carbon um, pricing and want more um, uh, that command and control and comprehensive uh, regulations on uh, polluters. So uh, that's still developing, but it, it's a significant change from 10, 12, 15 years ago when at least California environmental justice supported uh, carbon pricing. So I, I don't know what the temperature is right now in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, on these issues, both from uh, the moderate blue dogs um, in, in Congress to uh, advocates um, from the EJ communities of how they, they would respond to carbon pricing in 2021. But I think this is an evolving process. And what we see happening in the Biden administration, um, it's quite nothing like I've seen in the last 20, 30 years. It's, 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 it's kind of mimicking what has happened in California in terms of putting uh, key environmental justice in individuals in key positions in the administration and, and working to put a, a stronger focus on equity. So um, I'm really uh, excited and, 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 and inspired by that, but also wonder what it's that really going to look like at the end of the day. So I know you have to leave us soon, but I did, I have a couple, couple of closing points for you, Michael. Um, you got appointed to the water quality uh, control board and also you have other research. And so I thought maybe you'd like to comment on your new appointment and your new research before you have to leave us. Sure. Um, some of the new research along this is sort of that climate adaptation or disaster sort of studies research. So I'm looking at extreme wildfire events in California, particularly from an undocumented migrant and farm worker perspective. So I recently published um, in one of the leading uh, human geography journals um, on the, the Thomas wildfire that happened in 2017 in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties and how um, the disaster preparedness, response or recovery essentially rendered undocumented migrants, both undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants, invisible in the context of public policy and disaster policy, and how um, the so social justice, migrant rights groups, environmental justice groups had to really fill in that gap when there was no official government response to safeguard and protect these individuals before, during, and after a disaster, because uh, undocumented um, uh, migrants are, you know, uh, severely marginalized and um, stigmatized in society and are, are all. There he goes. Oh, no. <laughs> here, I thought my internet was bad. There he's back. Ah, here he is. You're back. We, oh. left, we missed the last uh, couple of sentences. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my internet. Let me turn off my video for the last few minutes. That might help because I, I don't know. A lot of people in my building must be on the internet today. Um, so essentially just looking at sort of the impacts to undocumented migrant communities. And then now I'm currently working on um, the LA Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, looking at climate uh, water resiliency issues and looking at the impacts of climate change to our our water systems and how we're able to maintain the quality of our water. And I was first interested in this on um, some drought uh, resilience um, research that I did um, in the San Joaquin Valley during the last extreme um, the drought we had a couple of years ago. And unfortunately it looks like we might may go into another extreme drought um, next year or later this year. And looking at how small uh, rural migrant communities in, in in the San Joaquin Valley were read, uh, left without any um, drinking water during the drought, let alone 
potable water just to take a shower or wash their dishes. And you may have seen East Porterville, um, which is a, a north of, of Bakersfield, and sort of these trailers coming in and um, for showers and how students um, yeah, uh, would have to they would have to open up the, uh, the junior high and high schools early in the morning for these students to be able to go take showers. So that that's where my initial um, focus on on water issues is sort of the access to safe and affordable drinking water um, came from. And here in Los Angeles, obviously this is urban water issues, but we still have a lot of our environmental justice implications of inequities that are happening in terms of uh, water quality and access to uh, our waterways as well. So I look forward to um, working with many of, of you on these water issues. I know some, many of you are interested on water issues and we're doing some uh, very important stuff. And in June, we're gonna be um, adopting the new MS4 permit. And Judy, I know you're a local uh, mayor um, and that's a, quite a big issue for local governments in terms of how they're gonna co come in compliance with the Clean Water Act. Very and in terms of yeah, in terms of stormwater issues, both in dry and wet seasons, and so this is a, a very a really watched issue for local governments and a quite costly and issue, but implications for our 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 ecosystems and our, the health of our ecosystems and the health of our local communities as well. Right for the audience, it's a it's a very big issue for local government. Local government has to comply with the. MS4 permits, and that means for most local governments, expenditures are fairly large amounts of money to, uh, to meet those requirements. The permits require you to reduce certain pollutants in the water. Um, and uh, so I know that our local cities are all thinking about that, and we're working together actually. Uh, the cities on the peninsula are working with the city of Torrance um, to meet those requirements. So. Michael, we may be coming to you for asking for help. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, th thank you again for this opportunity. And um, again, it, it's such a pleasure. I told you I, I, I served on a, a Democratic board in um, Sacramento, and I know that you're all volunteers. And you, you're volunteering your time because you believe you care about democratic politics, but you care about your communities most and foremost. So thank you for your time and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for attending. Okay, we, he had to go, but we want to continue uh, our discussion. I, I see a bunch of things here in chat from um, Denzi Nelson, and I thought maybe uh, instead of just you, uh, that you might want to talk about some of your experiences as well. Um, thank you. Yeah, and uh, again, again, I'm sure everybody has things to say, and I did put in chat a couple things. Uh, uh, on the media, it was really good this morning about union organizing and the uh, most recent Amazon fight, and it, the bigger picture of you know corporations' propaganda, all of that to discourage organizing. But getting to the climate uh, issue, as I think all of you know, I, I've been at this all my life. I'm 59. I was involved in the first Earth Day in, 20, in 1970. I was 18 years old. So it's always been a dilemma because I am white and I am pretty much privileged all of my life. And it was so um, disturbing and it was difficult uh, in, in, as the uh, equal justice uh, issues were coming up and the facts that even our California communities, you know, jobs and housing and so many other things seem to be, they take precedent and, and it, we weren't having enough impact in terms of lifestyle and health um, certainly for the planet, but just in their own communities. And what I put in the chat, and then I don't have to say anything more to it than that. It's always wonderful when someone comes up with uh, one of those epiphany moments, one of those St. Paul on his way to Damascus, you know, <laughs> knocked off, it, that gives you a tool to work with. And it was the late Senator Tom Hayden. Uh, I was fortunate enough to hear him speak in 2016, shortly before he died at the Culver City Dem Club. And he was talking about environmental justice. And it was just being talked about in a big way among our democratic leaders and as they were faced with it. And he gave us a great, gave me a, a, what's been a great and effective talking point is just to remind people of color and, and people in low income communities that they're the ones that are being mostly exploited by the dangers of, uh, envir uh, of, uh, of toxicity and those things that threaten our planet. And the succinct one that he gave is just check out 
the folks that live along the 110 freeway and how many of those kids are wearing asthma inhalers around their necks because of the emissions from that corridor. And it just to open the eyes of that their communities, they're one of so much more directly affected and exploited by things that we all have to do better for all of our communities and the planet. And that seems to have resonated. And I think that those talking points have, have moved us a little bit along with this environmental justice question. That's all. Okay. Well, I, I, I appreciated your comments and, and your experience with Tom Hayden and it's just great. Okay. Um, I think we still, I think it's just us, but uh, any last comments from Steve or Mike Muniz before we uh, end? Yeah, yeah I would, uh, following on Denny's comments, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, one of the lies uh, from the refineries again is shelter in place is the solution for an MHF release. And of course the homeless uh, cannot shelter in place. Um, and uh, the communities, uh, uh, the, the risk, they, they say, oh, it's too risky for them to go into an alternatives that are not proven. So they're asking, they don't want to take a business risk, but they're asking the kids that go to Wilmington Elementary School uh, 5,000 feet from the alkylation unit there or North High, uh, less than 5,000 feet from the Torrance, they can take the risk, that's okay. Uh, uh, but we can't because, and, and it's such a phony thing because there is no risk, uh, uh, no real risk because they these are proven technologies that large corporations like Chevron are selling. And uh, so the contrast uh, is is dramatic, and I think um, the uh, the the HF issue is a not an a chronic one, but it's an acute one, and uh, just like Beirut and just like all the Fukushima, these were all things unimaginable to happen, um, and uh, and uh, yes, it will affect if if and when it happens. Uh, you know, Chairman Burke said a lot of people are going to have to die before we get rid of HF. Um, Let's hope that's not the case. And um, yeah, I, I think we have to keep this and, and all the other things uh, right in the foreground. I think also what's, what's very important here is whether it's uh, MHF from the refinery, just living near a refinery. I mean, uh, or living near any of these uh, a, a pollutant industry, which is mostly in a poor community because the real estate is cheaper, uh, reduces your uh, life expectancy. And there was, um, there's been, you know, again, because it's Earth Day, uh, some very good articles this, this month on just this fact that uh, with COVID, you see an immediate death, but with air pollution, uh, you don't see the immediate death. It's, it, it takes a while. And there was just an article in LA Times where uh, a mother had to uh, really fight to get where her daughter died from uh, the pollution from a factory that was near their home. That's what she died of. But that to get that on the death certificate, you know, so someone could track, you know, what is the the real cause of death, um, it's, you know, it's abominable. So uh, that's what I think is going to be an organizing tool to get people together is, you know, it is that you could be living next to this refinery and you just don't realize how it's affecting your health. Or, or shopping in the Delamo Mall. Or shopping, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, Glenn, you wanted to mention the, the uh, I, did, I did, did mention, you wanted to mention something about the citizen climate lobby? Um, yes, I, I think it was um, Mr. Hall, D David, who recommended I, I investigate more because I mentioned the Carbon um, Emissions Act and the carbon taxes and things. I'm in the clothing industry and we're one of the big polluters. So I've really been working on fashion and trying to educate that part and sector of the business in um, all the effects that they have on the environment. 
And um, so I joined the CCL and we sent out letters and we got um, a really good response from um, Senator Ted, uh, Senator Alex Padilla, Senator Dianne Feinstein and Ted Liu all personally wrote back to me and engaged with me. And they're trying to push through this Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And I'm just wondering what everybody else thought about it. I'd actually like to have asked um, the professor, Michael, what his thoughts were on it, because I know that they were saying that the cap and trade wasn't adopted for various reasons. It was passed in the House, but not in the Senate. But now it seems like they've got senators on board. So uh, I'm just wondering if any of you know more about it because you know I'm always wary because these groups sometimes are wolves in sheep's clothing and are we doing the right thing in terms of what others think you so know in, in, in his book uh, that's uh, so I was trying to get to that in in one of my earlier questions to him in his book he shows where Schwarzenegger passed the cap and trade here in California but it was it was the environmental justice groups were very much against it. And the reason was because of how they, the money that was raised didn't go to the communities that were most in need. And it was only uh, once it was modified by the fight by the environmental justice groups. Uh, and then it was also uh, modified by Governor Brown that these other, com these other uh, the money was going to the proper places. So, that's what he talks about in his book. And he shows that if, if the fight's done in the right way, where research, the activists get with the politicians, then, then, uh, then cap and trade can be equitable. But if it's done where the way Schwarzenegger first had it, where it's just a way for the polluters to uh, you know, play a shell game and move where the pollution is, or let the pollution continue in the poor communities and, and, and they get off without having to be, having to change any industry. That's, you know, that's what he talks about in his book. Actually, so, if, I could, if I could speak to Glenn uh, for a second. Hi, I've been a member of CCL for uh, six years. Um, are you part of our Long Beach uh, South yeah. Bank group? Okay. Yeah. I, I've, I've stepped back the last few months, so I didn't realize that. But um, I, I uh, contacted Michael uh, directly just now and because I want to talk to him about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act uh, because we have a terrible time um, with the EJ community uh, educating them on it. They're very leery of market-based, as he said. And this is the other market-based plan, but it's very different than cap and trade. And um, it's not, a, uh, there's no way out of it. You can't buy your way out of, um, out of carbon fee and dividend. And I, I'm hoping we can get some help from him on that. Thanks everybody for joining. There is so much we have to do on this subject and we will continue just like David was saying, uh, you know, we have to, we have to attack, uh, you know, the changing climate right now. Um, also, you know, our last uh, meeting was on criminal justice. And I know in everybody's mind, since we've had that meeting as well, I mean, it's almost like on a daily basis with these mass shootings. Um, and then we have the uh, George Floyd uh, uh, case, uh, you know, you know, now going to the jury on Monday. So, uh, just so much on everybody's mind. So thank you for joining us. Uh, send us your questions, your comments, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month.